ECU in Fort Worth. So I have the honor to introduce our principal speaker for this year's workshop, uh, Peter Bubinick. Uh, Peter uh, earned his PhD in Toronto in 2003. Uh, after that, he was a postdoc in Lausanne for a little while. Uh, he then spent about 10 years at Cleveland State, which is where I first met Peter when he organized a, a CBMS conference featuring Rob Christ back in the day. Uh, since 2015, he's been at the University of Florida. Uh, there he was the founding director of the Applied Algebraic Topology Research Network, which promotes and enables collaboration in algebraic topology applied to the sciences and engineering by connecting researchers through a virtual institute. And these days, he's also a researcher in the NSF Simon Southeast Center for Mathematics and Biology, which is supported by a $10 million grant from the National Science Foundation and the Simons Foundation. So uh, the overall title of uh, Peter's series of talks is Topological Data Analysis. And this is lecture one, uh, Summaries and Distances. And with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. And uh, thank you very much, Greg, for the kind introduction. And thank you very much to the organizers. Uh, let me start sharing my screen here. Which might take a second or two, but I tested it just a minute ago, so we should be okay. Uh, let's try this again. Um, All right, I think we're connecting and there we go. So hopefully everybody can see my screen, thumbs up. Uh, all right, so uh, uh, about these talks, uh, I'm very flexible time-wise. I'd be very happy if people interrupt me as I'm going along. Um, so please do that uh, if you don't want to voice uh, your questions, please use the chat feature uh, in Zoom. Uh, the chat will be monitored and uh, Molly or Greg will interrupt me on your behalf with your questions. Uh, and also, of course, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end of the talk. All right, so let's get started. Uh, the subject of my talk is topological data analysis. And uh, this is a branch of topology. Uh, interested in analyzing data. So we're particularly interested in data that has a rich geometric structure that's uh, both crucial for understanding the data and is sufficiently complicated that standard methods uh, uh, don't necessarily do a fantastic job of getting all of the information out of the data. All right, so in a nutshell, uh, topological data analysis aims to quantify and learn from the shape of data. So we're looking for data with interesting shape. And uh, actually, once you start kind of looking out in the world for uh, data that's out there, it's very easy to find data with interesting shape. And in some sense, it's ubiquitous. Uh, and the trick, I think, is finding uh, places where uh, uh, standard tools don't quite do a good enough job and the problem is kind of sufficiently complicated and interesting that spending time uh, developing kind of more sophisticated methods that I'll be introducing end up being worthwhile. All right. So, uh, I'm gonna start with a bit of history. And as with many branches of topology, uh, we can trace uh, things back to the work of Marston Morse. Uh, so uh, maybe a bit of context, topological data analysis involves kind of different ideas, different approaches. In this series of talks, I'm gonna be focusing on one part of the subject, uh, which is a big part of the subject, uh, using a specific tool called persistent homology. And uh, so it's a branch of homology and uh, surprise, surprise, uh, we if we go back, we find the nugget that in my opinion is kind of the starting uh, 
start of this subject in the work of Marston Morrison, in particular in a very famous of paper of his going back to 1925. So I'm going to say a little bit about his work and I'm going to show you how part, there's actually a theorem in this paper that's uh, not so not as well known as some of the other results in this paper uh, that, uh, in my view, are the beginnings of persistent homology. All right, so uh, Morris was a analyst or maybe differential topologist, and he was interested in critical points of uh, smooth functions on smooth manifolds. Uh, so here in the middle, we have a, a compact surface, a closed manifold, uh, a real valued function on it, which is just the height of the surface as it's embedded in three dimensions. And um, there's two sets of numbers that we can associate with this surface. And uh, the analytic ones are coming from critical points of this function, so places where the derivative is zero, and uh, or the gradient is zero, I should say. And uh, for each of those critical points, we can associate an index to them. So this is a number. Uh, it's the directions kind of orthogonal directions in which the function is decreasing, uh, or more algebraically, it's the index, it's the number of negative eigenvalues of the Hessian. Uh, so let me, let's, let's start off by computing those. So the critical points are here. Uh, actually, let me pick a different color. It's easier to see. Um, so here are the critical points of our function which nowadays will be called a Morse function. And the index is the number of directions in which the function is decreasing. Uh, so here it's zero at the local minima. At the local maxima, it's decreasing in all directions, which is a plane, which is two dimensional. So the index is two. And then the most interesting points maybe are the saddle points where it's decreasing in one direction and increasing in the orthogonal direction. So those points have index one, and we can record all that in information by a sequence of numbers, which just tells us the number of points with a certain index. So we have here that uh, the number of critical points of index zero is two, the number of critical points of index one is six. Let's see, I missed one and the number of critical points of index two is two. All right, now there's a more sophisticated set of numbers, which are the Betty numbers. And um, uh, so let me give you kind of a naive description of them. So the zeroth Betty number is the number of connected components of our uh, surface, which is one. Uh, the second Betty number is the number of cavities inside the surface, which is one. And uh, the trickiest one in this case is the first Betty number, which is the number of uh, cycles that are independent modulo boundaries. Okay, so let me show you some of these cycles. So there's one that goes around this handle, uh, which doesn't, can't be bounded on the surface. Uh, there's another one that goes around this handle. Uh, the, the, the easiest ones to see maybe are these ones here and this one here. So that gets us up to four. And it turns out that that's the right answer. Uh, what's not so easy to see is that there is uh, another handle that we can grab onto here. But it turns out that cycle uh, can be written as a combination of the other ones modulo a boundary. So that's an exercise for those of you uh, at home. All right. Now, uh, I want to be able to write down Morse's theorem. And to do that, it's helpful if we uh, record these numbers in a more efficient way as coefficients of a polynomial. So let m of t be the polynomial whose coefficients are these m sub k's. And let beta of t be the polynomial whose coefficients are the Betty numbers. All right. Uh, so what you notice is that uh, 
one of these sets of numbers is bigger than the other. And so it's a theorem of Morse that that is true. Uh, and so we can look at the difference of these polynomials. And that difference is a polynomial with non-negative coefficients. Uh, but more than that is true. It, if that polynomial factors. as follows. All right, so there's a one plus t term that factors out of that difference. And uh, this difference here, d of t, has non-negative coefficients. All right, so what have we learned? Uh, so let me summarize this maybe from a modern view of persistent homology is that the excess of critical values, uh, and actually, before I do that, maybe it helps to, to take a step back and, and talk a bit about the other, some of the other results in this paper, uh, which are also kind of important ideas for persistent homology. And to do that, uh, let's consider the values of this function and not just the critical points. So let me pick a particular value. Uh, so a height here, let's call this height A. And now if we look at the inverse image of that value, we get uh, what's sometimes called a level set of the manifold. And uh, now I'm gonna look at everything who has a value below that. So this is sometimes called a sublevel set, and it's a subset or it may be submanifold here. So um, sublevel set. And uh, one of the uh, great results in this paper of Morse is that he proved that as you vary this height A, the topology of those sublevel sets only changes at the critical points of the function. All right. And furthermore, at the critical points, it changes in a particular way. And one of two things happens either uh, one of the Betty numbers increases by one or one of the Betty numbers decreases by one. So we have homology being born or homology. Uh, dying. And so now if we go back to this theorem, the excess of critical points uh, are places where either homology is born or homology dies. And what this theorem tells us is that those births and deaths pair up. Okay, so the excess factors and uh, it factors into pairs, okay? These pairs are controlled by this term here. And notice that there's a one and a T, so it tells us that the pairs differ by degree one. So there's a birth of homology in some degree uh, by adding in a critical point of some degree, and then a critical point of one degree higher kills off that homology class. And this polynomial D of T uh, counts all of those birth death pairs. Okay, so this D of T counts uh, birth death pairs. Okay, and as we'll see in my in the next part of the talk, uh, the the main part of persistent homology is is counting birth death pairs. And it's, it's coming from this theorem of Morse. Now, the, there's one ingredient that is not in Morse's paper, and this is the, the, the only important thing left for persistent homology, which is that uh, what's missing in this theorem is the critical values corresponding to the birth death pairs. Okay, so all we're, we need to do is to come up with a way of also encoding in those critical values, and that's going to give us something called a persistence diagram. Okay, so we have these birth-death pairs, and those are going to show up 
uh, in our modern take on this. So, all right, so let's move on to persistence diagrams. All right, now in computational settings, we start off with some discrete data. Uh, so here is a toy example of this. We have a hand-drawn uh, digit, the number six, somebody drew that. Uh, it was scanned uh, and then encoded as a bunch of grayscale values on pixels. Uh, but I wanna think of this in the same way as we thought of a Morse function on a smooth manifold. All right, things aren't smooth, but we can still kind of deal with this in the same way. We think of grayscale values as being uh, our y values, our height values. And so we think of this as being a function on the plane. Uh, and let's say the black has a value of one, sorry, zero, black is zero, and white is one. So as we raise the level of our level sets, uh, our sublevel sets will contain things that are black and then kind of lighter and lighter. So initially we get just the black stuff and then it fills in with the more gray, uh, gray stuff and eventually we get kind of everything because everything is, is white or darker. All right, so, um, so as we raise that threshold, we get an increasing sequence of sublevel sets of the plane, some collection of pixels. And this gives us a topological encoding of our data. All right. And if we want to be applied topologists, this is exactly what we want. We want to take uh, data from some scientist engineer, experimentalist, encoded in a way that gives us a topological structure, in this case, a diagram of spaces or diagram of uh, cubical sets maybe. Uh, and, and, and then we forget about the data, all right? So we just have this kind of uh, geometric structure and, and this is what we're gonna work with uh, throughout. All right, so what do we do with the diagram of spaces? Well, one thing we can do is we can apply homology. And in this case, so we're gonna apply homology with some fixed degree, maybe one if we're looking for the whole and the number six. And uh, we're gonna do one thing that is somewhat unusual from a topological point of view which is we're gonna take coefficients in a field, all right? And we'll see that that has some really good computational and algebraic advantages, all right? And, and combinatorial advantages as well immediately. So, uh, so once we do this, we get a diagram of vector spaces and linear maps between them and since the linear maps compose for every pair of integers, uh, notice I've taken kind of a, a discrete set of levels here. So we just have finitely many vector spaces, which is important computationally. And so for any pair i, j, so for any interval between i and j, where i is less than j, we get an integer, which is the rank of the linear map from the ith vector space to the jth vector space. Okay, and we can nicely graph the values of this rank function. And I've done that for you here in the, in the top left here. So the i less than, the integers i less than j live in this kind of upper half plane to the upper left of the diagonal. And, uh, Let's not draw the zeros. I draw all the non-zero numbers. And this is kind of a toy example of what this rank function looks like. All right. Uh, so this is what we're going to get our persistence diagram from. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Uh, but before I move on, let me just uh, introduce some notation language that we're going to use later. Uh, this diagram of spaces is sometimes called a filtration. 
and the diagram of vector spaces is called a persistence module. All right, so we'll be seeing more of the theory of those in the next talk tomorrow. All right, so first we want to do some computation here. We have this rank function, and it turns out that there's a combinatorial procedure for extracting uh, kind of a, a complete and concise and uh, invariant out of this rank function. And this uh, goes back to work of August, August Ferdinand Möbius, uh, who developed uh, this idea of Möbius inversion in the context of number theory. And then much later, Giancarlo Rota realized that uh, this procedure applied to any partially ordered set. Okay, so here we're looking at intervals in the line, uh, intervals nest, uh, so they have a poset structure. So we can apply this procedure of Möbius inversion. Peter, can I interrupt you real quick? Yes, please do. Uh, we have a quick question from the previous slide about, Thank you. do you mean the rank of VI minus the rank of VJ or the rank oh. of Thank you. I wrote too quickly and I missed something. So thank you for stopping me. I do not mean Vinus. That was certainly confusing. Uh, that was meant to be an arrow. Okay, so uh, composing the maps in the persistence module, we get a linear map from the ith spot to the jth spot going from left to right. And then we can uh, compute the rank of that. Thank you. All right, thank you for asking that and interrupting. All right, so hopefully, hopefully that makes sense now. Thank you. All right, so maybe it's inversion. What do we do? So uh, for each point, for each lattice point, uh, the maybe it's inversion in this case reduces to a simple inclusion exclusion formula. So if we're interested in, uh, let me pick a particular point here, this point here in the grid. And what we do is we just look at four numbers, that number, and then uh, it's three neighbors up and to the left. Uh, and then in the second kind of figure from the left, uh, we do a little addition and subtraction. So we go A minus B minus C plus D which in this case is two minus one minus one plus one, which of course equals one. And that gives us the blue dot here in the same spot. And there's actually only three spots in the plane where you get a non-zero answer. All of them in this case are one indicated by the blue dots and everywhere else you get zero. Um, so you, you, you can also kind of think of this as a kind of a discrete derivative. If you're kind of moving down from the top left, this is places where uh, you kind of hit changes in a certain way. And the interesting thing is that this procedure is invertible. So there's kind of a summation pr procedure that allows us to reconstruct the rank function from the persistence diagram. And what we do here is if we want the rank at any particular spot. And this time, let me pick um, this point here, which is over here. And then we would just look uh, to the upper left quadrant from that point. We count the number of dots and that recovers the number three, which is the rank function. All right, and um, let me say something about the interpretation of this persistence diagram. So this point here is two comma eight. Uh, and these are critical values for the birth death pairs in Mobius's theorem, or sorry, not in Mobius's theorem, in uh, Marston Morse's theorem. Okay, this is the extra information uh, from an applied point of view that's missing there. And, and so this is the birth uh, critical value of a birth of homology. And this is the corresponding critical value of the death of that homology. Okay, so persistence diagram is encoding the critical values of these birth death pairs. Uh, and another way of thinking of that in terms of linear algebra is that these birth death pairs give us um, 
a choice of bases for the persistence modules that kind of persists and what we'll see that there is a computational way to get at these. All right, so let's look at one, it's still a toy example, but maybe less toy example than what we had before. And this is actually the most common way that persistent homology is used. It's certainly not the only way, uh, but uh, it's, it's a simple way of generating topological structures uh, from data as we to turn our data into points in Euclidean space, some finite number of points. In this case, we have points sampled from an annulus. Uh, we build a simplicial complex out of those by kind of iteratively joining up nearby points uh, with edges and triangles. And then we take the homology of that increasing sequence of simplicial complexes. And on the right here, we have uh, two persistence diagrams, one for homology in degree zero and one for homology in degree one uh, in black dots and pink circles. And what you notice is that um, in degree zero, uh, we have a lot of birth-death pairs because initially we have a lot of connected components, a hundred of them. Uh, most of them get linked up pretty quickly. Uh, that's what we see here. And then one point, one connected component kind of lives uh, forever. So that's up here. And then in homology, we get some cycles, small cycles, and then we have uh, one large cycle, which we see over here, uh, which ends up dying when that hole gets filled in. All right. Okay, so we've now uh, have a way of doing some topology with our data. And uh, persistence diagrams have lots of nice mathematical features, but to a data scientist, uh, they, uh, there's one thing that we really want, which is that uh, experimentalists don't just run one experiment, they run experiments repeatedly, and they want to be able to do things uh, like compare the results of one experiment with another. So we have not just one persistence diagram, but many of them, and we want to be able to compute distances between them. So uh, here we have two persistence diagrams, uh, one in the top left with orange dots and one in the middle with blue circles. And uh, we want to compare the distance between collections of points in the plane. Of course, we know how to measure distances between individual points in the plane, uh, but two things uh, make this situation kind of interesting. One is which is that the number of points might differ, and the other is that uh, not all points in the plane should be treated equally from the point of view of um, persistent homology because uh, birth-death pairs that are far if the numbers are far apart, meaning far from the diagonal, uh, that is a feature that lives for a large number of values. And as those birth-death pairs get closer and closer together, which means the point gets closer to the diagonal, uh, that should somehow have a vanishing contribution to distance. All right, so uh, it turns out that there is a, a very natural way to, to do this distance, and there's actually a one parameter family of distances uh, indexed by p between one and infinity. And what we do is we allow ourselves to match points. So we draw both persistence diagrams together, which I've done on the top right here. And uh, we need to, we play a little game in which we are asked to match points from one persistence diagram to the other with an extra kind of cheat rule, which is really important, which is we're also allowed to match points with the diagonal, uh, with the nearest point on the diagonal. And if we do that, then there's only kind of finitely many options indexed by the symmetric group. And uh, each of those kind of choices of matchings gives us a list of numbers. And then we just take the p-norm of that list of numbers. That gives us the p-Wasserstein distance uh, and, uh, the word here, Wasserstein distance, uh, is also used in a slightly different context of measuring distances between probability measures. 
uh, sometimes called the earth mover distance. Uh, it's, it's crucial, it's kind of central to optimal transportation theory. And uh, these two notions are actually kind of intimately tied and have a common generalization, uh, which was only worked out recently by uh, Devol and Lacombe uh, last year, and this has kind of been extended by a student of my Alex Altison as well recently. So Peter, maybe I missed it, but you said this can handle when you don't have the same number of points in D and D prime, in that case is sigma just any function or, or uh, so one set to the other? Or? Yeah, so to be precise, uh, one thing we can do is for each point on the persistence diagram, we also stick in the closest point on the diagonal. And, um, and yeah, so there's a subscript R here, uh, the symmetric group on R letters. Uh, R is the sum of the cardinality of the two persistence diagrams. It ends up being that, yeah. So, so it's, it's, not, it's not huge, it's something. Uh, so this is, there's some computational challenges to this, but this is something that people have come up with good algorithms of doing. Did that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay, thanks, Greg. All right. Um, so uh, next up, I want to show a, a nice variation of the persistence diagram. And this is uh, some recent work uh, with a couple of my uh, now former PhD students. And this is... Uh, a refinement of the persistence diagram, a kind of a graded version of it. And it uses uh, some very old math, uh, maybe the oldest math there is in a certain sense. And uh, so we, we were all familiar with working with decimal notation and, and kind of binary. And we, we were familiar with uh, that we can do things in any base b greater than or equal to two. Uh, but something that I think people are maybe less familiar what, with is that we can also do things in base one, which is sometimes called the unary system. Uh, so using the same arithmetic that we do for the other bases, we can write three as one times one to the zero plus one times one to the one plus, sorry, I mix things up. Let me start over. All right. So three is one times one squared plus one times one to the one plus one times one to the zero. All right. So that's certainly correct. And uh, using any of these arithmetic expansions, of course, in decimal, we write 278 as 278. In binary, we write five as one, zero, one. And in unary, we write three as one, one, one. All right, yes. Uh, so you might recognize this as tally marks or uh, maybe the Roman numeral three. And some of you may also recognize that if you rotate this horizontally, you get the character for three that's still used in uh, um, most of East Asia. All right, so, all right, a bit of toy baby mathematics, but let this, let's take this math seriously. And uh, we're gonna use this to do a variation of the rank function. So for any integer k, we're gonna define the kth rank function. Um, so it's again gonna map intervals so i comma j so it's going to be a function on intervals it's going to send i comma j to zero if the rank of this linear map from vi to vj is less than k and it's going to send it to one if that rank is greater than or equal to k okay so this is a map from intervals to the integers, but in particular to the subset of the integers given by zero and one. All right, 
So the thing to notice here is that this is exactly the kth digit of the unary expansion of the rank. All right, so with that observation, that observation exactly implies that the sum of these kth, graded, kth rank functions is just the rank function. And now the fun thing is, is that this ranks function is still a integer valued function on the intervals. So we can again apply, apply Möbius inversion. All right, so the top right here, we have the Möbius inversion that we did before. And now I'm gonna repeat this with the K, with all of these rank sub k functions. Uh, so I've, I've gone ahead and showed you what the uh, kth rank function is. So that's the collection of numbers. It's all zeros and ones. I've only drawn the ones. And now we do this inclusion exclusion formula. And just as before in most places is zero, but in some places it is one, uh, which are the blue dots. And what's interesting is uh, we also get minus ones in some places, which are the green circles. All right. In fact, those are the only options, zero ones and minus ones. And uh, again, all of these things are compatible. Uh, so if we call all of these resulting persistence diagrams, which now have zero ones and minus ones, let's call these the graded persistence diagrams. So we have three non-zero ones in this case. And those, uh, so what we showed is that uh, those sum up to the ordinary persistence diagram. Oops, sorry about that. So the sum of these DKs is equal to the ordinary persistence diagram. So it's a refinement and um, of the persistence diagram. It gives us extra information. All right. So, um, so one thing you observe if you do a bunch of these is that the plus and minus ones occur in a staircase pattern. And there's, there's kind of a natural change, change of coordinates from this kind of funny upper half plane to the usual upper half plane. So we move the diagonal down to the X axis. And now we observe that these plus and minus ones are, if we kind of connect the dots, they are critical points of a piecewise linear, of a unique uh, piecewise linear function with slope plus and minus one. And the plus ones are exactly at the local maxima and the minus ones are exactly at the local minima. And uh, so for each K greater than or equal to one, we have one of these and uh, so, of course, we can assemble all of these into uh, a collection. So let me do that. So we have these kth persistence diagrams. And now we have a collection or a sequence of functions from R to R. And, of course, we can assemble that into a single function from N cross R to R. So just by letting lambda kt is defined to be lambda sub k of t. And now under mild hypotheses, this function is square integrable. So it sits inside this Hilbert space. All right. Uh, and this is hugely exciting. Maybe most topologists are not initially excited by this, but let me <laughs> convey my enthusiasm for this. Why is this exciting? Because in a Hilbert space, we have an inner product, so we can compute angles and distances Furthermore, it's complete, so limiting objects and constructions make sense. And uh, once we have an inner product, we can do linear algebra, all right? And there's huge subjects of statistics and machine learning 
uh, which are central to data analysis. And almost all of the algorithms in these subjects uh, use linear algebra and only linear algebra. Uh, so as soon as you can, as soon as you're in the setting of a Hilbert space, you can apply almost any algorithm of those subjects. All right, so what we've done is we've now taken data and done some uh, interesting topology, and we now have a summary of our data where we can apply all these tools from these subjects. And uh, what's particularly exciting for me is that this function that we've created uh, is something that I had previously defined using more ad hoc methods. Uh, which I call the persistence landscape. And now uh, we have kind of this very nice uh, mathematical construction of it. All right. Um, and I think this might be a good time to pause because I've now built up all the tools that I need to use for the last part of my talk, which is an application, a very recent application that I'm very excited to tell you about. Uh, but if you have questions on uh, anything that I've built up to now, uh, maybe let me try to clarify that before we see how it's used in an application. <laughs> I, I have not been checking the chat. Does anybody have anything in the chat? Uh, I see a hand raised. Jose, please. Uh, uh, hi, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I have a couple of questions. This is certainly a wonderful talk, by the way, um, uh, about uh, the coefficients of, of your uh, homology groups. You say that you want to work on a field, right? So then, so then uh, is the characteristic of the field matters or the- Great question. There is a, a, a field. Uh, so, so that's a great question. Mathematically, the answer is no. Uh, everything that I've shown you uh, works in any field. Uh, and, but now computationally, uh, one field, is nicer than all the others, uh, which is the simplest one, which is Z mod two, the field with two coefficients. Uh, binary coefficients uh, are uh, particularly nice on a computer because binary arithmetic is in fact encoded into hardware at the most fundamental level. Uh, so it's very fast on a computer. Uh, so unless you have a reason to use other coefficients, uh, the standard thing is to use Z mod two, and, and that's the fastest way to do things. But that's uh, not the only game in town, and there are there are there might be places where in which you want to use fields of other coefficients. Um, all right, but actually that's kind of a more technical question. Uh, maybe let me save the technical questions to the end. So. If your other questions are like that, why, why don't we save it to the end? I was hoping there might be some more simpler confusions. Uh, Peter, there are okay. some other questions that have shown up are, in the chat. If you can want you to pick a simple in. question, maybe? Is, is there any? Um, so, so one is, can this machinery be used to compute geometrical parameters of topological objects, i.e. radius of the detected circle? Um, so the short answer I would give is that these uh, which is that the persistence diagram and anything built out of it is a very rich invariant and it captures lots of information. Uh, now it doesn't capture everything because of course, um, so, so there's kind of, uh, there's where do we lose information? And of course, losing information is a good thing in topology because uh, you want to lose the information you don't care about and keep the information that you do care about. Uh, so uh, the, the secret kind of sauce of everything is how do you encode the data that you're given into a, a diagram of spaces, all right? 
And, and that's maybe the most important step because after that, it's all math. And before that step, it's, there's some art to it. Uh, so you lose some information there. Uh, after that, um, in topology, we tend to use, lose almost all the geometric information. And uh, one thing that's, I think, maybe not so clear to appreciate, especially for a topologist, is that these methods, even though they use homology, uh, which is very topological, uh, a lot of geometric information is saved in there because we have this filtration, uh, which keeps track of uh, geometry in some sense. All right, it's a little bit subtle, but I would say the short answer is yes. Uh, a lot of geometry is, is in this persistence diagram because we remember the critical values. Okay. All right, I think that's all I'm gonna pause for right now. So thank you for those questions. We'll have time for more questions, uh, but I do wanna get onto this um, application that I'm very excited about. Okay, so this is uh, uh, work uh, that I've been working, that, so this work's been going on for a few years, but it's just recently appeared. In fact, just uh, uh, recently accepted. And this is uh, work with uh, a postdoc that's been working with me, uh, Ashley Thomas, uh, my PhD students, Alex Elchison and Irina Hartsock, uh, and then a collaborator of mine who's a biologist, Hong Lu at Georgia Tech, and her student, Kathleen Bates. Uh, and I'm gonna start by showing you a video. So uh, in Hong Lu's lab, uh, they work with C. elegans, which is a very uh, well-studied model organism in biology. And uh, reasons are it's very simple. It's happy to live on an agar plate, so you can kind of grow it and observe it in the lab. It's translucent. Uh, it's Cells, cells have kind of been completely classified. Uh, and uh, one of the things that, uh, so we can take videos of these worms as they're crawling around and we'd like to quantify that. Uh, uh, so my goal as a topologist is to quantify the shape of the movement of these worms as they're moving around and give, give use that as a tool for the biologists to quantify and learn uh, from these worms because they perturb them in various uh, experimental ways. All right, so this is one video that I'm gonna analyze very carefully. And uh, let me kind of give you some commentary uh, that's gonna hopefully be helpful later. So it's initially the worm is crawling forward in a nice kind of sinusoidal pattern. Uh, so it's a repetitive forward motion. And at some point it changes its mind, it transitions to a reverse motion. Uh, the reverse motion has these deeper bends. And uh, while it's reversing, it briefly pauses and then it continues reversing. So let's see that again. So it's going forward. Uh, here transitions to a re reverse motion. Here we've got reverse motion with deep bends, a brief pause, and then it continues going in a reverse manner. All right. Okay, so hopefully you guys saw that. And let me go back to my tablet here. And I think we'll hook up faster than last time. All right, so all right, so we have this video. So there's a bit of pre-processing that's done initially, and uh, we extract a midline of the worm, uh, which is a kind of spline curve which we turn into a piecewise linear curve. So it has a hundred piecewise linear segments. Uh, we have a sequence of angles of those segments. Uh, so that gives us uh, roughly a hundred numbers that 
uh, describes each of the frames in the video. And then we can kind of concatenate all those frames to give us a, a video of a bunch of piecewise linear curves. And that's what you see in the middle here. Uh, so this is the encoded data. So this is the data that we actually worked with as mathematicians. Uh, now the next step is to turn this into a point cloud in high dimensional space. And we use this uh, great idea that was developed by Jose Perea and John Herrer uh, called the sliding window embedding. And what we do is we take not just one frame, but a sequence of frames, of, so some number of frames. In our case, we took 20. And uh, we concatenate all those 100 numbers from those 20 frames. So this gives us a 200 dimensional, sorry, 20 times 100, 2000 dimension, 2000 dimensional point. And now we just uh, slide those frames along the, slide that window of frames along the video. And that gives us a sequence of points in 2000 dimensions. All right. And now we can visualize that by projecting down uh, there's a method called principal component analysis based on singular value decomposition that does that for us. And uh, here we have two of the low dimensional projections. And uh, this gives us a sequence of points going from dark to light. And, and now what we can see actually is we can interpret this and we see so dark initially is this is the forward sinusoidal motion, which is repeating. And then it transitions to the backward motion, which is easier to see from this point of view. So, so it went forward, transition to backward. Then there's a brief pause, which is actually easier to see over here. And then it continues moving backward. All right. And already as a topologist, we should be excited. We're seeing cycles, we're seeing homology should be a good tool for capturing this information. And in fact it is. So this is kind of the flow of things. So um, uh, we have data kind of sliding window embedding, high dimensional point cloud. And now we do persistent homology. And so I do that. And this is exactly what the persistence diagram comes out to be. This is the corresponding persistence landscape. And now there are four dots on the persistence diagram that are further away from the diagonal than the rest of them. And let me uh, give them letters. So uh, let me call this F, uh, T, B, and P. Okay, so there's corresponding points on the persistence landscape, B, F, T, P. And now the great thing about homology is that if we, we can go down to the cycle level and we get cycle representatives of homology. And persistent homology software will do this for us. Um, warning, this is kind of now more there's more interesting mathematics going on here that one needs to be careful of. Uh, so uh, cycle representatives, uh, these are what, what they come out as. All right, so let me kind of remind you. So this was B, F, uh, T, P, and uh, this is F here. The first one, notice, is the initial part, that initial loop, which is the forward motions. Uh, then the next one here is T. That's the transition from the forward to the backward. Uh, the biggest one here is B. And then we have the pause here. All right. So as a topologist here, this is incredibly exciting. We have found the kind of the four characteristic motions in that video were exactly captured by the persistence diagram and its cycle representative. All right, 
So, so I was super excited about this. Uh, now there's only one downside to this, which is that this is a result that I think only a mathematician can really be excited about. All right. My biology collaborators, it requires quite a bit of explanation as to why this should be exciting. Uh, but we worked a bit harder and now I have something that I'm even more excited about because this is something that I think that the biologists are excited about. And the great thing is, is that with this data, each of these dots, each of these uh, vertices in these cycle representatives actually corresponds to a chunk of video. And as we go around the cycle, we get, we can kind of trace out screens, uh, images in the video, and then we maybe do a bit of smoothing uh, and, and we can get video cycle representatives. All right, so let me show you what these are here. Um, all right, and so using those cycle representatives, uh, we have here F is forward, T is transition, uh, B is backward, and P is pause. All right, so now we have a topological decomposition of the video into uh, synthetic characteristic uh, cycles uh, of cycles that give us both the persistent homology and characteristic motion of these uh, worms. All right. Uh, now we, we did this a little bit by hand. There was a bit of uh, by hand stuff that needed to be done. Uh, but I'm confident that this can be automated and uh, done on a larger scale. And that's something that we are working on. And with that, I will end my talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> just sporadic clapping from two people just doesn't have that resounding effect if we were all in person. But thank you, Peter. Thank you. Uh, do we have more questions? I think there were some I didn't get to earlier. Yeah, let me read you some questions from the chat from earlier. Um, so one is, can you explain a little bit more about the negative rank in the graded persistence diagram? Ah, great question. So, um, well, there's different ways in which I can answer that question. And maybe let me start by uh, a more a sophisticated answer, a mathematical answer, which is maybe not what you're looking for. Uh, so mathematically, uh, one way to look at the view, the persistence diagram, and let's me go back to the persistence diagram. Um, is um, so both the One more. so the persistence diagram um, is a collection of points in the plane. Uh, that collection of that structure has a map algebraic structure, uh, which is that it is each persistence diagram can be thought of as a element in the free commutative monoid on the plane. So it's a formal sum of points in the plane, uh, an element of the free commutative monoid on the plane. Okay, we can do arithmetic, we can add persistence diagrams. Uh, and uh, it turns out that that's a fruitful thing to do. There's kind of some nice formal things one can do with that point of view. And in fact, one thing um, uh, Alex Elchison showed is that uh, 
is that you from that using that formal point of view, you can obtain the Wasserstein distance formally, meaning functorially, uh, from the distance on the underlying plane. Okay. Uh, now, if we go an additional step further, uh, we can get to a setting where the numbers can be positive and negative, uh, which is we take the free abelian group on the plane. Okay, so uh, this is the same construction from going from the natural numbers to the integers, uh, which can be called the Grittendieck construction. And uh, so uh, boring language in, from other places, we can call these virtual persistence diagrams. So uh, these graded persistence diagrams, um, we can call them virtual persistence diagrams. So we're just moving into kind of a richer mathematical setting, which allows us uh, to do more things. Now, uh, I think what you're really wanting is a, what's an interpretation of these. And um, so uh, there's different ways to do this. Uh, and uh, well, may maybe just the simplest one is that the, the positive points are kind of maxima of the local maxima of the persistence landscape. And the negative ones are local minima of the persistence landscape. Uh, what does that really tell you? It tells you if you look at um, uh, so yeah, let me let me draw a picture here. Um, so if we draw our half plane here, if we take a parameter value t where the persistence landscape is one, so if lambda k t um, so, so if we have a maximum for lambda k t, uh, that tells us that if we look at the kth graded rank function, so if we're interested in the rank of those maps and the persistence modules being at least k, then t is kind of a midpoint for which uh, the persistence is maximal. Uh, and so it ends up kind of looking locally like this, which means that we can fit in kind of, a, there's a long interval here in which the rank is at least uh, k. And then the negative ones are, are kind of local minima of this. So if we shift to either the left or the right, we can get longer intervals in which the rank is at least k. All right, it's a little tricky. All right, but let me move on to the next question, I think. Jose, do you want to answer your, or ask your question? Um, yeah, I have a, a last question. Um, uh, regarding your graded um, persistence diagrams, uh, I'm not a topologist. I work in representation theory of algebras. And then I look these by using quiver representations. How you guys uh, look at these um, graded persistence diagrams by looking at graded your representations at all? Uh, fantastic question. Uh, so there is a nice connection uh, between this subject and the representation theory of quivers. And I encourage you to come back for my later talks where this will make an appearance. Uh, so I, don't, I won't say anything about that now, but maybe uh, if you can attend uh, my other talks, I think it'll in particular I'll show up in the third talk. Near the beginning of the third talk, I'll talk about that connection. And then maybe after that, we can have a discussion. If you're not able to make it to that talk, uh, send me an email and I, I, we can, I can say more about that offline. Okay, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, we have another uh, question in the chat. So 
Peter, you said that one might get many different diagrams to compare. Can you give examples? Easy. Uh, well, so on the one that I'm showing here right now, uh, we sample points from an annulus. Uh, to be precise, take, take an annulus, uh, put on the uh, surface area measure that's uniform with respect to the Lebesgue measure and uh, sample from that probability distribution uh, independently a hundred times. That's how, that's how I got those points there. Uh, so we get a random collection of points. Uh, from that, we get a random filtered simplicial complex and we get a random persistence diagram. And uh, well, what's, we can repeat this. So do this a hundred times. Uh, one thing you can do, one nice thing about the persistence landscape is since it's in a Hilbert space, it's easy to average. Uh, so we get 100 persistence landscapes, we average them, there's an average persistence landscape. Uh, and that, in some sense, converges to the expectation of a random variable uh, on this underlying probability distribution. And um, so that's kind of a mathematical case, but the more common case is that an experimentalist, some, somebody you as a mathematician are working with who's not a mathematician gives you some data. Almost always there's, there's a bunch of, there's an Excel spreadsheet with a bunch of rows. Each row is some experiment with a bunch of observations. Uh, so for each row, you apply topological data analysis, get a persistence diagram. Now you have a hundred of them and you want to do some, something with it. Uh, so most of what I've showed you is how to do the topology for one row. And then once you've done that, then you can kind of stick it into standard statistical and machine learning methods um, to get things like p-values uh, and uh, do things like uh, supervised and unsupervised learning to do classification and clustering. See, I think uh, Sean has his hand raised if you want to ask your question. Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, nice to uh, see you, uh, Peter. Um, I just had a question about the, uh, it seems that you're using predominantly uh, um, you know, Betty one, right? One dimensional cycles. Is there any use uh, for going higher dimensions in your uh, TDA applications here or no? Great question. <laughs> uh, so my background's in algebraic topology and homotopy theory. And, uh, and much of that subject is most interested in very high dimensional things. And uh, so I'd be, tremendously excited if we could do high dimensional stuff in, in applications. Uh, now there's, the short answer is yes, kind of, I mean, there's no theoretical obstruction to doing things in, in high dimension, but there's kind of two important practical, there's a number of practical obstructions. Uh, one is that computationally, uh, the number of simplices uh, in a simplicial complex of higher dimension kind of grows exponentially. Uh, so the computations end up getting very challenging quickly. Uh, and then the other aspect is that if you are actually looking for higher dimensional homological features like Betty numbers, like voids, cavities in large, like high dimensional cavities, say you're looking for uh, S7 in your data. The, the difficulty with these methods is that if you are missing kind of, so the annulus here, we can see the hole because we can wrap all the way around it. But if all of our points were only on one side of the annulus, then we wouldn't see the annulus with this construction. And in higher, higher dimensions, things, space is big, high dimensional space is big, and it gets kind of prohibitively expensive to fill up 
things in a way that you can kind of detect high dimensional features. Uh, so, so I think you're unlikely to make much use of things beyond zero, one, two, maybe three. Uh, maybe I'm wrong, but I, there's kind of, you need kind of exceptional reasons and exceptional tools to do things beyond that. Uh, uh, but I would say don't be disappointed because there's lots of great mathematics, even with H0, H1. Uh, there's still uh, lots of interesting mathematical questions and, and, and mathematics to be done. Uh, and we'll see more of that in the next talks. Um, Atish, I think. Yeah, I have a quick question about when you talked about the slide that had the Mybius inversion on it, if you can bring it up. Yes. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this inverse procedure of summation, uh, I was a little confused that does it depend on uh, some sort of origin? I mean, is it unique, this summation? Uh, it's diagram? unique. Uh, it only depends on these. Um, so the, the whole procedure just depends on having a partially ordered set. Uh, and then it's, uh, it's, it's unique. Uh, and in this particular case, the uh, so for every for, for every pair i comma j with i less than j, uh, that gives us a point in this half plane, uh, which which I circled in green here. So so if we, if we take this actually this spot in the persistence diagram, um, what do we do? We look at the upper left quadrant, um, which. I've highlighted here, and we count the number of dots that lie in that quadrant, and that gives us the number of three. And then if we go back to what we started with, we see that we recover the correct number. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. There were a couple more chat questions. So um, for the application at the end, how is 20, the embedding dimension determined? Ah, heuristically, well, no, let me say two things about that. So one is biologically, maybe it's, um, actually, no, let me not say biologi biologically, um, mostly heuristically, uh, that number 20 is not very important. Uh, we tried lots of different numbers. And uh, actually one surprising thing that we found out kind of late on is that if you do more sophisticated things than I showed you here, you, you try to do some machine learning on this data uh, to try to, and actually to, to larger sets of data, which you can see in, in, the, in the, if you look at the paper, which is on the archive, uh, we look at kind of more complicated data and then we try to uh, do some machine learning based on the environment uh, that the worms are in. And in that case, this window length, we tried a bunch of windows and our results were got better as the window got smaller and smaller. <laughs> in fact, down to one gave us the best answer. I mean, all of them were almost the same, uh, but one gave us a slightly better answer surprisingly, uh, but at, when you go down to one, these images that we have on the right are a lot, are somewhat noisier. So kind of taking a sequence of frames somehow ends up smoothing the data and it makes it easier to interpret and also to construct these, these nice videos at the end. Um, uh, but I would say the number 20 isn't so important. And uh, uh, one kind of really nice uh, advantage of these methods, which I'll talk more about in the theory, is that there's kind of theorems stating th th things are stable. And uh, relative to other methods, they're, they're relatively parameter free. And the parameters that we do end up using uh, often uh, our procedures don't end up being very sensitive to those parameters.
Okay, our last question in the chat, Peter, is um, did your recent discovery realizing the theory in Hilbert space, space play a role in your analysis of the motion um, of C. elegans? Uh, so uh, I have to say the short answer is no, because so, uh, the, so it's the, yeah, so uh, the, the, my, the persistence landscapes is, is a now kind of an older idea. So go, going back to 2000, it was published in 2015 in JMLR uh, and preprints were a little bit before that. Uh, so uh, the idea of mapping into a Hilbert space is now kind of fairly standard in topological data analysis. And uh, there's a number of methods in fact, there's many methods uh, and, and all of them work quite well. Uh, so, uh, so for me now, this is kind of my, I have a kind of a standard pipeline. Uh, I even have code in R that kind of takes some filtered complex and then goes all the way through to the, to the persistence landscape, which uh, actually you can encode as a vector. So if these, this is a sequence of functions. Uh, if you just sample them on a grid, uh, you just get a vector and then you just, you just have a vector. So, uh, and, and then you just, you, do, you just do standard methods with a vector. So that's definitely something that I'm looking to doing uh, with all of my, uh, whenever I will work with data. Uh, so the, the new part here was this, there's this kind of nice combinatorial way of getting at the persistence landscape. Uh, Rick, do you wanna ask? Oh one? yeah, um, do those four cycles uh, that you found in the motion of C. elegans, can biologists relate that to anything in the nervous system? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, now you're asking a question that my biology collaborator is really interested in. Uh, so, uh, so C. elegans is a particularly, well, so it's, it's useful for many things in biology and it's, it's, it's particularly well studied with respect to its nervous system. Uh, the, the neurons have been completely written down. There's 302 neurons. And uh, since, since the organism is translucent, they can actually kind of see these, they can manipulate them so that the neurons will flash when they're activated. Uh, so she has these wonderful videos of flashing lights of this nervous system as the worm is thinking and uh, when we started collaborating, this is what we started looking at. Uh, but I got, I got scared. <laughs> so, uh, well, I, I think it was the, the, it's fantastic data, but it's from, for using these tools, uh, at least, at least at the time we started looking at them, the data is quite noisy. And I didn't think my tools were ready to attack those types of problems. <laughs> uh, so we shifted to kind of uh, data that's much less noisier. This video data is very clean. Uh, and certainly down the road, we would like to be able to do things like that. And I think it requires some advances on the mathematical front that we are working on and also advances on the biology and engineering end in terms of kind of capturing clean, clean enough data that we can uh, try to uh, get something out of it. Uh, but that's, that's the vision, yeah. What are, what are the worms thinking? Yeah, can, can homology tell us something about that? Uh, that would be great. Sean, did you have another question? Sorry, no, I guess that was a residual hand. Uh, let's see, I don't, how do I put that back down? Oh.
well, if uh, I may, may ask one more, uh, Peter, uh, in general, uh, philosophically from the uh, graded persistence diagrams, uh, what type of extra information can one get uh, in general without, uh, I, you understood, uh, you explained the technical part, but for a practical point of view. Uh, good question. So, uh, maybe the short answer is that it's not clear yet. Uh, so, uh, so this is this is very new. Uh, in the the form, so persistence. If we translate it into persistence landscape, those have now been used for a few years and it, they've had some very nice applications. Uh, I don't know of any specific applications to just the graded persistence diagram. Uh, I would say is that, uh, is that uh, our group is looking into its theoretical properties and we have some nice initial results about it. Uh, and we're happy, hoping to maybe say more about it in the future. Uh, so, so my students, uh, Alex Alterson and Irina Hartsock, uh, are, are, are looking at it and they have some, some interesting initial results. And uh, I guess one thing that I can say is that it is, uh, in a precise sense, it's uh, more discriminative than the persistence diagram. Uh, so there is a... Uh, the Wasserstein distance can be extended to the graded persistence diagram. Uh, so this is something that Alex Alchison's done. It's on the archive. Um, and I think I might even have something about it on the end here. Uh, so, um, uh, but we need to take P equals one, it turns out. Okay, which is, kind of the nicest version of this earth mover distance. Uh, and for these graded persistence diagrams, since they're positive and negative pieces, kind of just like with signed measures, there's a Jordan decomposition. And, and using that decomposition, we can define a, a distance between graded persistence diagrams. So we kind of move the negative parts over to the other side of the equation. And then we take the, the usual one Wasserstein distance between them. Uh, and so... Um, and the sigma has stability also? Pardon? It has stability also, this sigma, this, uh, the, uh, the graded... This graded von Wasserstein distance, yes, it is stable as well. So that's that's a paper, that's a theorem at the very end of this paper, which uh, is uh, has been accepted to discrete and computational geometry and should be appearing shortly. Uh, I just submitted the proofs <laughs> yesterday. So um, okay, thank you. It's on the archive though. So according to the schedule, we still have about five minutes left for any more discussion or questions that anybody has. If not, we can end a couple of minutes early. I see a raised hand. Uh, hi. Thomas? Thomas? Yeah. Uh, hi, Peter. I had a, I had a quick question. Um, when you're looking at the representative cycles in the C. elegans uh, mm. study, um, unless I'm mistaken, I mean, there's a couple of choices you have to make, right? The, these uh, cycles yes. exist for some time, but even at each time, there may be many choices. How did you choose the representatives? So, uh, so this is a great question. And uh, this will be a great subject for a talk, I think. Uh, so the short answer is we didn't in that we used some software that computes persistent homology uh, 
that simultaneously computes cycle representatives uh, and a number of the pack standard packages for persistence diagrams will do this for you. Uh, and they do both simultaneously kind of using a greedy algorithm. Uh, so it's in some sense canonical uh, because if you choose a total order on your simplices, um, then, then, it's, then you get these canonical cycle representatives. Now, from a geometric point of view, they maybe aren't the best things. And in fact, if you look kind of carefully on the third one, uh, you see the large cycle going around, but then you've got some other little stuff on the inside. Um, and what you might want is what is an optimal cycle geometrically. So maybe what's the shortest cycle if you're in a one cycle, what has the least line segments, uh, or uh, in if, if, if you're in like an H2, what like encloses the least volume, uh, and there's different variations of this question. And uh, there are very interesting computational topology questions of whether or not one can do this. And uh, certain variations of this question end up being NP hard. Uh, but other variations, people have polynomial time algorithms that uh, work well. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, so if you're interested in that, there's definitely some papers. If you shoot me an email, I can uh, maybe point you to a few of them. Uh, I'm not an expert uh, on these things, but I'm kind of aware of the work and it's really interesting. Uh, yeah, but we, we just did the naive thing, uh, which is just to kind of use a greedy algorithm to give us a cycle representative. And uh, that worked well enough for us. Uh, but I, th I think if we were to do this kind of more seriously, we'd have to start thinking about those types of questions. Thanks very much. Rick, go ahead. Um, in the figures in the slide you're showing us, are the, uh, like in the one on the left, I assume that the green loop is the, the cycle that's derived from the points that are the data, is that correct? Uh, almost. So the, uh, the only extra thing is because we've done this sliding window embedding, we actually take a window of frames. So uh -huh. it's 20, 20 frames of the video concatenated together rep are represented by each of those points. And then uh -huh. kind of the next point is, uh, sliding that window over by one frame. So the first one would be frames one through 20. The second point would be frames uh, two through 21. Yeah. So what, what it, it, there's this little kink at, at the right end, end of that green loop. Does that mean anything? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the pause. Uh, so if, um, if, if we look at the kind of the toy uh, video here, um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you when it's starting. Okay, right now it starts, so it's moving forward. Uh, then it kind of stops, it transitions to going backward. And right here it pauses, and then it keeps going backward. Okay, that little loop is exactly the pause. And uh, we see it kind of most clearly here. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that's actually the, that's actually something that if you don't do the sliding window, uh, you don't see it. So if you just take, uh, if you just straight on put each frame as a point in a hundred dimensions, uh, you get a point cloud that looks very similar to what we have here, uh, but it's a little bit noisy and it's noisy enough that you cannot see that loop. 
And when you go ahead and stick it into the persistence diagram software, that point there for the pause is not there. Okay. So that bit of smoothing uh, of the sliding windows is crucial for, for getting that kind of subtle uh, behavior. All right, any more questions? Shall we? I, I think I see one in the chat, but I, I think it's a new one, but I'm not 100% sure. Go ahead. From, from one one Lee. Uh, so I guess we need to choose the correct representation cycle in order to get the graded KX module corresponding to the persistence module over K. Is that right? Um, I'm not so. Sure, I understand. I don't think I understand the question. When when do you wanna to to clarify? Uh, yeah. I mean, this is not really like a question. I just like want well, like follow up uh, about like a you know a previous question, but regarding to the representation cycle. Um, yeah. So I think um, those you know. So we have to choose those you know representation like carefully so that you know so the thing it actually matches up to the graded module graded kx modules we got uh, i don't know whether or not it makes sense because you know to me a uh, a uh, uh, a persistence module is a functor um and so there's a like you know uh, equivalence of uh, two categories one is the persistence module the other one is the graded KX module. Um, so, um, you know, so the persistent diagram gives us the information about the decomposition, like, you know, in the graded KX modules. Uh, yeah, anyway, so it just, I mean, it's, so it's not like a question, I just want to point it out. Yes, so, so, yeah, so thank you. So, what you said is definitely true. Uh, so the, the persistence module can be viewed as a graded KX module. And I will discuss that in my third talk, <laughs> if you're able to make it to that. And the, uh, but now when we're looking for cycle representatives, we are looking at the chain level. So we have kind of a derived view maybe of that. We, we look at this, there's a filtered uh, chain complex here and uh, but we have many choices of cycle representatives that will give us the right homology class and will in fact give us the right persistence homology class uh, for that persistence module or equivalently for that graded kx module uh, so so there's there's many choices and there's uh, yeah, so that's, and then you, you want kind of the nicest one. <laughs> uh, and you can define that mathematically or you can define it kind of aesthetically <laughs> for uh, a practitioner who might want to be interpreting the data. And, and hopefully those uh, two questions should be free. Hopefully the, those things will give the same answer. Thank you. 